I don't know why I remember this. It's kind of funny how things are. You just I had a uh, a childhood memory. I'm not sure why. We'll see if anybody else has the same type of memory. But it, it's very uh, it's very applicable this time of year as well. Uh, when I was growing up, I remember when there would be like tornadoes, or there was a very distinct chance of tornadoes. I, let's see, I, don't, I don't know why I remember this, but I had this visual in my head of looking out the front window of the house and, and you would always see guys around the neighborhood standing up on their roofs watching the store. Um, I don't know why I remember that, you know, it was just kind of, you know, one of the, now I will say this though, in, in their defense, this was also before, you know, Gary England and multi-vortex, dual pole, high resolution, 4G Doppler radar, so you know, that you, you got up there so that you could see, you know, what, what was coming. And I guess you could, if you're in a neighborhood, it does make sense that, you know, if you get up a little bit higher, then you can see what's going on. But it also kind of struck me, you know, in hindsight, that's probably not the safest place to be. Uh, you know, you may be able to see the storm coming, but I think you're also susceptible to wind, uh, hail, lightning, you know, those, those types of things. And I, I don't even remember hearing about anybody in my neighborhood dying, you know, during that, though I'm sure it's probably, I'm sure it's happened. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I, I said, I don't know why I remember that. I just, I got to thinking about it. And uh, the reason I shared that, that fond memory is that we're going to be talking today about rooftops uh, of sorts. We are, we are actually going to be uh, in 2 Samuel. So if you want to go ahead, you can turn there to 2 Samuel. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Number, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel. Okay. Uh, and so if you want to go ahead and turn there, and I kind of, we're going to be looking at an account. Now you may remember uh, a few weeks back, we, we looked at an account by, by David. We talked about David and Goliath, and I kind of get you caught up here, but what we know is that David, you know, at that point then, he was anointed to be the next king over Israel, okay? Uh, David would be, uh, he was a mighty warrior. He was uh, an excellent leader. Uh, he was a great leader. Uh, he was also, uh, he was a, a great musician. Uh, he was also a poet, okay? We know those things about him. What we also know is that David was referred to as being a man after God's own heart, okay? But we also know that David had failings, and uh, he had faults. And in fact, today we're going to be talking about one of his uh, most glaring failures. And, and we're going to do this actually in two weeks. And so uh, today we're going to begin talking about his greatest failing, his greatest failure. Next week we're going to come back and we're going to kind of talk about the aftershocks or or the effect of his decisions that were as the result of this. So. If you're in 2 Samuel, we're going to be in chapter 11, we're going to get verse 1. It says, In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. And so we know springtime is wartime. Okay, That is when all the king's men and all the king's horses <laughs> go off to war. Uh, usually the king went with them as well, okay? Uh, we know that Joab and, and the Israelites, they go and, and they're waging a successful campaign. And, uh, you know, but unlike normal, David stayed in Jerusalem. He did not go with them, okay? Why? We don't know. We just know that he didn't. And so then it says here, verse 2, one evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. So here we go. You know, David, one night, he can't sleep. He, he's laying there, he can't sleep, so he gets up, and, and he goes, and he's walking around. He's walking around up on the roof, and as he is up on the roof, he looks out there, and he sees this woman taking a bath, possibly uh, in a courtyard, which could be seen uh, from up on the rooftop there at the palace. And uh, the reason I say that, we're not going to go into it real big time, but there, there's plenty of evidence that by and large at this point Bathsheba was innocent 
uh, in in all of this up to this point. I, I'm not absolving her uh, of any, you know, all culpability, but the fact is that I, sometimes we get this image of David and Bathsheba coming up with this plan and being equal partners in this. And I really, uh, you know, as I read it, I don't think there's anything that says that's completely accurate. I think at this point, uh, I don't know that she's necessarily doing anything wrong. Okay, what we know is that all of the Israelite army, all the men, and what should have been the king are supposed to be off at war. And I don't think that she was up on the rooftop. She was probably in a, a more private courtyard at the time. Uh, but the fact is that you know, David looks, he sees her, and, and then he decides that he's going to send one of his palace uh, servants to go and you know, find out about her. And... Yeah, we're not sure how. I don't know if he describes her or if he says she's over there, you know, starts pointing to where it is. But it's interesting that, you know, the palace servant, whoever he gets, immediately says, Isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Now, the reason that's important is that right there what we know is that when he says this, David knows that she is the wife of one of his men, one, one of his soldiers that he has sent out into harm's way. So he knows that. But even beyond that, okay, is the fact, the little brief genealogy when it says, you know, isn't this the, the daughter, okay, of Eliam is the, what we also know is that would make her the granddaughter of Ahithophel, which was David's favorite and most trusted advisor. Worked in his Courier. Okay? And so, but even knowing all of this, knowing that, that she is married, knowing that she is the wife of one of his uh, soldiers, knowing that she is the granddaughter of somebody who works very closely with them, he still does what? Yeah, bring her. And so she comes to him and uh, says she came to him and he slept with her. She had purified herself from her uncleanness. Then she went back home. So Bathsheba you know, goes back to her house. The, the encounter's over, or so they thought. You know, and then a, a period of time goes, and she discovers that she's pregnant. So she sends word to David you know, to, to let him know. And uh, so then you know, she, she sends that message there. Well, so then you know, David decides, okay, something, something's got to happen. You know, she says, well, I'm pregnant. Uh, in other words, it's your, it's your fault I'm in this position, so we need to do something about it. Next move is yours. And so David then sends word, he sends a messenger to go to Joab. Now, Joab was his nephew, and I think it's interesting that we keep this in mind, that Joab is, is David's nephew, so family member, but he's also the, the commander of the army. And so he sends a message to Joab, basically saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. And so Joab does what, he, what he's told to do. He turns around and he sends Uriah back from the, uh, from the battlefield and sends him back to Jerusalem. And so he comes back in there, you know, and David, he, he reports to the king. And David comes in and they sit down and, and I'm just kind of having a little, little small talk. So how are things? How was the trip? How's Joab? How's how's the how's the battle going? You know, I mean, it's just kind of this weird conversation. And he said, "Okay, well, I'll tell you what. You're probably tired. Go home. Wash your feet. Relax. Hang out." And so Uriah leaves. And so David then wants him. You know, definitely wants to make sure that he's relaxed. So he sends a whole bunch of food to his house as well. And and what's David's thought? David's thought is, "Okay, you've been at war." And we don't know exactly how long, but you have been at war. And so now I brought you back. So you're going to go home and you're going to walk in the house and you're going to relax and you're going to see your beautiful wife and you're going to think, hey, I'm here. And so then you're going to you're going to sleep with her. She's going to, you know, then everybody's going to think, hey, must be Uriah's kid. And so then what do we have? Everybody's off the hook. I mean, that's Uriah. He doesn't know any better. So he thinks he's got a new child. And Bathsheba's reputation is saved, and David is is off the hook. Okay, and so whew, we're that that's the best answer for it. So, uh, 
What happens is that then Uriah, instead of going home, what does he do? He spends the night in the courtyard with David's servants. And so word comes to David the next day, you know, that Uriah didn't go home. Okay, he, he spent the night uh, in the palace court. So David calls him in and he says, <coughs> haven't you just come from a distance? Why didn't you go home? Okay, and, and Uriah responds in verse 11, he says, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents and my master Joab and my lord's men are camped in the open fields. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. I mean, this guy's got character. And in fact, if, and if you go back, if we read in, in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 21, actually verse 5, we, we are really led to believe that at the same time, David and all of his men made a vow that they would abstain from sexual intercourse, from sexual relations, while they were fulfilling their military duties, okay? And so that's why we're kind of, you know, when, when Uriah responds here and says, how could I go to my house and do that, you know, when everybody else is off the board? No, I would never, ever do such a thing. So, um, so David has to think fast, so he invites Uriah. He says, okay, we'll come back. Okay, you spend the night one more night, Okay. So Uriah agrees to it. He says, come back and have dinner with me. So Uriah comes back. He has dinner with him. And David's goal now is going to get him drunk. So David gets him drunk because he's thinking, you know, hey, maybe he could resist temptation first time, but now we'll get him drunk. He'll, you know, he'll be inebriated. He won't know what he's doing. He'll go home and, and he'll end up, you know, giving in to temptation. So he doesn't go home. Because verse 13 says, But in the evening Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. And now the question is, did Uriah know something? Matt, there is a chance that maybe one of David's you know, palace servants had just kind of let something slip that maybe made Uriah think a little bit more about what he was doing. Or it could be that a drunk Uriah had <laughs> was better at withstanding temptation than a sober King David. Okay? Uh, but either way, David recognizes now that his plan is not going to work. Okay, so he has to he has to think. And I don't know. We don't know if David sat around all night thinking about this. Of, well, what happens if he doesn't? And what are we going to do? And what's my going to? I'm going to have to do this. And you know, we don't know if he sat up all night thinking about that. Uh, we don't know if this was a snap decision. If he just assumed that was going to be the case, and now you know when he finds out that Uriah didn't go home, and all of a sudden that changes it all. Uh, but he now has to do something else. And in what is always true, the cover-up always seems to be worse than the original sin, the original violent, whatever it is. It was true in Watergate. It is true now in Bathsheba Gate. Okay? It's... I, honestly, it's true in our lives as well, isn't it? I mean, it, it's funny the lengths that we will go to uh, to cover up, to rationalize, to to hide, to ignore. You know, our our sins, our failings, when whenever we uh, do things. And so, like I said, the the cover up is worse than what the original sin. Because you arrived at the home, and so David at this point says something's got to be done. So he writes a note to Joab. Okay, writes him a letter and, and then gives it to Uriah and says, take this to the commander. And I, now think about this. Did anybody ever, anybody ever get sent to the principal's office by your teacher and sent with a note? Anybody ever do that? Did anybody else ever read the note? I mean, I did. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> it only happened once. <laughs> uh, but no. Okay. Needless to say, I think David sealed this one. But, but think about this for a second. Imagine the gall uh, of, of what's going on here in the fact that David, he writes out a note, he puts his seal on it, he hands it to Uriah, and, and this note guarantees Uriah's death. 
And then he gives it to Uriah and says, take it to Joab, the commander of the army, who is now the, the de facto executioner as well. I mean, it just can't, you start thinking about it of, of the lengths that we have gone to at this point, and, and it's amazing. So Joab does what, what he's supposed to do, okay, what the note says. Uh, he takes and he sends Uriah and, and some other men into basically an impossible situation. And then when they are there, he pulls back the rest of the troops. And as a result, Uriah and these other men are killed. Okay? So, uh, you know, now, if you think about this. So now Uriah is dead. But there's other people that are dead as well. And Joab, the king's nephew, has blood on his hands because he's the one that sent them there and purposefully drew back the troops so that they would be killed. And so now word's got to be sent. And so Joab sends a messenger to, uh, you know, to go to King David and to tell him what had happened. Uh, and you know, one of the things he tells the, the messenger is that he's, you know, need to go and, and report this to the king. And, and if he gets upset about what happened, you need to tell him. And Uriah was one of the men killed. Okay? So the messenger goes back. And, and he does. He begins telling the king what happened and, and what is the king. You know, David starts to get upset. And then the messenger says, and you know, your servant Uriah was among those killed. At which point, David's tune changes and he's kind of like, well, you know what? It's war and these things happen. Tell Joab not to be too upset. Don't be too discouraged. So, I, and I always wondered, have you ever wondered how Bathsheba got word? You think she got the military knock out the door? You know, that they showed up and said, by the way, your husband, or, you know, did David, I don't know. It's not, it's not a huge, just kind of questions that I have as I read things. So, now you have them too. <clears throat> but, uh, so she mourns for her husband. We don't know exactly how long the mourning period was. I know that uh, in, in Jewish culture, Jewish custom today, it's 30 days. That is the period that you would mourn. And so, but after that is done, the, uh, David sends for her again. And she comes into the palace, and she is then made his wife. And I think a lot of people were, you know, you start to think about this. You chances are you have watched and you've seen somebody, whether it's your, you know, whether it's your boss or somebody you know in the community or whatever, that you think that their integrity is like way up here, and then you start to see things, and you're like, "Ooh, really? Huh? I wonder what that is." And I think that that was probably the case as well. You know, there were a lot of people that wondered, okay, well, she married awful facts. And then she married the king. You know, and no doubt there were servants in the palace that knew exactly what was going on. And in about six months, when she gave birth to a baby boy, I think everybody knew what was going on. Okay? And, and we're going to come back to that uh, next week. Okay? But I want us to kind of... You know, pick up here a little bit because I think that there's something that we, we absolutely have to talk about. And it's really where the title uh, of the sermon came through. And it's a message that says, Get off my rooftop. And I don't mean that as in cranky old man, you know, that you yeah, get off my rooftop. But, or get off my yard, you know. <clears throat> get off my rooftop. When did David's problems start? David's problems started when he was where he did not need to be. His problems started when he was not where he needed to be. Okay? David's problems started on his rooftop. And I, you know, I guess that's where we get ourselves in so much trouble so many times. <coughs> that there are places we don't need to go, yet we still go there, don't we? Too many times, okay? And the, I, I think we allow ourselves to go places that we shouldn't go. We allow our imaginations to go places that they shouldn't go. We allow our feet to take us places that we shouldn't be. And, and I, you can sit here and, and you can tell me and, and every. It's funny how we rationalize. 
and say it's harmless and you know and it's nothing. Oh, it was never anything big. You know what? Tell that to David. Tell that to Bathsheba. Tell that to Uriah. Tell that to Joab. You know, the fact is that that as we as we read this, you know, one of the things that the Bible tells us is that sexual sin is one of the most devastating sins that there is. Okay? In fact, the, the scriptures tell us in 1 Corinthians 6, we're told to flee from sexual immorality. And, and you wonder why it says all other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. And in this case, it wouldn't be on that. I mean, in, in this case, you know, it, it cost Uriah his life. It cost others their lives. And I know we, you know, we always go, well, yeah, but that was just one instance and that was just in the Bible and this, and that, you know. And, and we always say, you know, I would never go that far. Go read the story. Is there anything in the story that tells you that David ever thought he would go that far? David didn't look down from that rooftop and say, ooh, you know what? I can have her if I kill Uriah. No. What did David do? He, he was where he did not need to be. He started looking at something that he didn't need to see. He then thought that, by, you know, I'll just let my imagination go just a little bit. I'll enjoy a little bit of eye candy. But then I really can't. I just I want to know a little bit about her. So I have something, you know, I'll find out something about her. So now we're going to get a little bit closer look. Okay? And then when she gets it, well, I've gone this far. And so, man, I'd like to have sex with her. So he does that. We'll then come to find out what she's pregnant. Well, we can't allow the, the nation of Israel to find out that their king, I mean, the king of Israel, who also is, is kind of, besides the priest, he is also the de facto religious leader of Israel. He is the king that is, that is leading them. Can't find out that he can't control his lusts, so we got to cover it up. And if we can't cover it up through deceit, then we're going to have to cover it up by getting rid of the problem. It wasn't that big of a step. You know, it seems like we've come so far. But that last little step was not much because David had already gone so far, hadn't he? You know, Casting Crowns uh, sang the song Slow Fade. And it's, it's exactly what it is. I, there is nobody that... It, nobody sets out with the goal of, of destroying their marriage or of destroying their family through infidelity, do they? Nobody does. I, I have not done a wedding yet where in, in the premarital counseling I was informed, hey, you know what? I'm really just doing this until something better comes along. <laughs> <laughs> and we laugh about that. But you know, that's nobody starts out with that. On the day that you say your I do's, you are committed for a lifetime. When you say I do, you're planning on this being for the rest of your life. Nobody starts out saying I do until something better comes along and then I'm going to ruin it and I'm going to get rid of them and I'm going to get me the other one. Nobody starts out there. But how do we get there? One little step at a time. And the problem is that one day we look up and we find that, that we, we've allowed ourselves to do something that we shouldn't do. And now we're trying to cover up something that never should have happened. And we're trying to save something, our, you know, our marriage and our family, that we never thought that we could lose. And it's just a couple of steps. And it all begins, I'm sorry, but it begins by us standing on our rooftop, going where we don't need to go. I, I was thinking about this. There, you know how I love little turns of a phrase. We need to learn, okay, how to look at what we're looking at. Watch what we're watching. We need to think about what we're thinking about. 
Okay? How different would our lives be if we would do that? If we would take a serious look at what it is that we're looking at. If we would watch what we're watching. If we would think about what we're thinking about. And, and I know that you know in a lot of this we, we think of it so many times about... Uh, it, this applies to all areas of sin. I do think first and foremost it does begin... Uh, and, and sexual sin is the perfect illustration for this because let's be honest about all sin it is the same way. It looks very, very good in the beginning, but come to find out it brings a whole lot of baggage with it. That's the reason that the Bible uh, speaks about it so many times. And I know there's a lot of people, they would take you know this message, they take this passage and want to turn it around to a message of, you know, a, a plea for Puritan values and you know, strict dress codes and, and baggy sweats and no makeup and, and, you know, separate rooms for everything. That's not what I'm talking about. You know, the fact is that God made beautiful things beautiful and, and to be admired. Okay? But there is a fine line between admiring and lust. There, there is nothing... There is nothing wrong, and I. We're seeing we we've gone to this point in our culture, uh, to where you can't, uh, you can't appreciate beauty of anything, okay, uh, and I think it's where we have twisted it because we've removed the fact that you know what we can't see something and appreciate it as beautiful. We can't appreciate something and see it as, as looking nice without having to turn it into lust. That's where we don't, we have lost the ability, I say lost the ability, we have given up the ability and, and foregone the idea of controlling our own thoughts. I mean, guys, I'm sorry, if, if we see, yes, if we see a woman who is wearing something that is, uh, that is less, that, that it needs to be, is it our responsibility to avert our eyes? Absolutely. It, it's, it's not on us to, to expect her to cover up, to do, it is our responsibility to avert our eyes. In the same way, ladies, if there's a guy that he's wearing stuff that it's too tight or it's too short or it's whatever, it is your responsibility to avert your eyes. It is your responsibility, our responsibility as men that we need to look at what we're looking at. We need to watch what we're watching. We need to think about what we're thinking about. That is our responsibility. Because we're going to find ourselves... I mean, we can sit here and we can have this discussion in church. But do we spend all of our time here? So what happens when we go out and, and unchristian people dress like unchristian people? We just give in? No. We need to learn how to flee sexual immorality. We need to learn how to keep ourselves pure. And yeah, I want to turn this around just a second too because we do have another side of this. And it's not just that we walk out and we see it. And we have in so many ways, we become, we become like the culture that we look too much like the culture as well. And we rationalize that, you know what, it's not my problem, it's their problem. Uh, I, I had a girl, this was many, many years ago, but I, I still remember, I mean, we're talking many years. <clears throat> Holy cow. Uh, we worked together at a grocery store and and she she loved low cut and and there was this guy that was in one time and older guy and you gotta love the fact that he just had no filter okay uh, she is checking him out in grocery store checking him out and uh, <laughs> he was checking her out though uh, and then she gets offended at it. And she, you know, one of those, you know, hey, take a picture, it'll last longer, kind of, you know, attitude on it. And he just looks right at her and, and he says, I'll tell you what, I wouldn't look at it if you wouldn't flaunt it. 
And and I, it was just kind of okay. <laughs> but but here's the deal: we do have this to where we have an actually, You know what? That it makes me feel pretty. It's what I like. It looks good on me. It's what everybody else is wearing. If they got a problem with it, that's their problem, not mine. Well, yes, it is your problem. It is your problem because the Bible tells us that we are not to allow our freedom to become a stumbling block to others. There's another reason that it is your problem or it can become your problem. Something that is not your problem can very quickly become your problem. When the right man or the right woman says the right words and shows you the right attention and you're in the right frame of mind, you end up with the wrong result. Okay? Uh, it, it's not that far of a step. And I'm just telling you, I, I will plead with you on this because we find it all throughout. We find it all throughout the Christian church. Okay? Uh, men and women who never ever set out with the goal uh, of letting infidelity destroy their marriages, who have allowed their marriages to be destroyed by infidelity because they were sure that they would never go that far, because they were sure that it would never get to that point, because they were sure that they would never let that happen. And all I'm saying is that it is when we put ourselves in the wrong situations, in the wrong places, we put ourselves in tempting situations. We, we need to figure out, honestly, we need to figure out what our rooftops are. And, and it's not just, this is not just in, in sexual sin. Uh, though, though this is what the Bible does have to say about it. Paul wrote this to the church in Thessalonica. He said, it is God's will that you should be sanctified that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathens who do not know God. And in verse 7 it says, For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. And I say that just because it, it is very easy in, in this story, okay, to look just at the sexual end of it. But, you know, as we, as we kind of wrap up here, I, I want to ask a question. What are, what is your rooftop? Because it's not just, or we're not just talking about sexual sin. It, it doesn't matter whether it is with temptation to whether it is temptation with drugs, with alcohol, with stealing, with coveting, with any of those things. I think we all know as we examine ourselves, if we're honest, we kind of know where our rooftops are. We know the places we don't need to go, whether it is with our feet, whether it's with our hands, or whether it's with our minds and our imagination. We know that. Okay? We know that there are sites that we should not click on when we are on the computer. Why? Because we know where it is going to lead us. We know that there are people that we should not spend time with because we know the impact that they have on us. We know that there are things we should not be involved in because we know that they get us sucked into other things. We know that, if we're honest. But we spend so much time I, I'm sorry, we spend so much time arguing and rationalizing that, you know what, it's no big thing. There's no, there's no law against it. It's not illegal. It's not immoral. It's not against company policy. So there's no reason why I shouldn't. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Because it is a slippery slope, and, and all of us know to some extent where our rooftops are. And we need to do whatever we can to stay off of them. If David would have done what kings do and gone to war, he would have never found himself standing on that rooftop and tempted with doing something that kings should never ever do. He would have never found himself in the case of having to cover up something that the king should not have done. Where are your rooftops? We're going to end here. 1 Corinthians 10.12 says, So if you think you're standing firm 
Be careful that you don't <coughs> fall. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to have our time of decision. And I really would, in, in this moment, is, as, we are, as we are singing this song, <coughs> would you please think about that? What are the changes that you need to make? What's the thing that you could walk away from here and do that would eliminate the ability to get to that rooftop? What is the thing that would eliminate that one temptation? Okay, and, and then... Ask for exactly this. God gives us more love, but we're asking for more power. More of the ability to be able to withstand temptation. More of the ability to make tough decisions and not go where we shouldn't be. To do the things that we ought to do, not the things we ought not to do. To help us control our hands, our feet, our eyes, and our imagination. That's what we need. I'm going to ask, we're going to have our prayer rooms open. That if you need prayer, if you need somebody to pray with you, to pray for you in this moment, Maybe there is something that you struggle with. It. You struggle with it bad. And you know that on your own, you're never going to be able to defeat it. You're never going to be able to overcome it. But, but in this moment, you really, you're so afraid to tell anybody. You're so afraid to admit it. We're going to have our prayer rooms open. All you need to do is step into one of those rooms. One of our elders, one of their wives, be more than happy, more than welcome to pray with you. You don't have to say a thing. All you got to do is walk in and say, I need prayer. That's it. If you have a decision to make, I invite you to make it now.